<laughs> Great to see you this morning. And happy anniversary. Church anniversary, how many years? How many? Wow, imagine that many years. And, and how many more? We don't know, Lord, we'll have to see. <laughs> it's up to him. It's wonderful. So welcome and great to see everybody. And uh, if you're visiting this morning, uh, we have uh, little pew cards in there. If you want to fill one out, uh, please do. I'd love to connect with you. As well, we have a prayer jar at the back. I know it doesn't look like much, but I do go through it each week. And there's little right at the back there, Sean has got that prayer jar. And uh, you can write a little note, fold it up, and go, oh, yes, I'm sorry. I keep thinking I have the other mic on. <laughs> so that jar is right back there. And if you want to put a prayer request, it's confidential, and I like praying over them during the week. So, friends, welcome to Anniversary Sunday. We have a special guest from uh, CBM who's going to be speaking on both our anniversary and mission, which we love here at uh, LBC. So we're excited about that. So um, with that, we'll leave it with girls for oh I just want to just sort of pump the lunch and learn that's this week right lunch and learn this week Thursday we know it's good food and we're going to hear about Switzerland so I just wanted to get that out there really quickly bless you church well good morning it's lovely to be with you again on such a beautiful morning we're going to enjoy all this weather aren't we before it really really changes so it might be the last time to wear a summer dress so I said it's a summer dress day that's for sure well as we gather on our 161st church anniversary, don't we look back with thanks for the love and the service of those who came before us. And we look together at the present, at what the Lord has called us to do and to be right here in this moment, encouraging each other in our walk of life and in our walk of faith. And we trust him for the future, knowing that he is faithful and that his steadfast love endures forever in whatever history there is planned for the future of our witness here in Lakefield. So as we come to worship, let's stand and we have a call to worship to read together today as we think about our anniversary Sunday. And the words are from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us worship him standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of Christ my Saviour Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God my Saviour Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall 
listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Saviour lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know Because he lives, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know Please be seated. Jesus, oh, for Jesus. to be Jesus all for Jesus all I am and have and ever hope to be all 
of my ambitions, hopes, and plans, I surrender these into your hands. All of my ambitions, hopes, and plans, Surrender these into your hands, for it's only in your will that I am free. Let's bow our heads in prayer. We are, all of us, wonderfully made. Young or old, weak or strong, we are able to both receive and give love, to be blessed and be a blessing to be singers of the angel's song and point to the one who gives life. We are all of us wonderfully made. Thank you, creator God, whose promises are firm and faithful, who lives with us each every moment and who loves us each one. On this special day in the life of our church, as part of its story today, we bow down, young or old, weak or strong, with open hearts and outstretched hands, in humble adoration and simply pray, Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am, and have and ever hope to be. As part of our worship, as we take up our offering, we ask that you would continue to bless this place of witness in our village. May we point to the one who gives life and hope and joy and peace. And we pray for our children in Sunday school, along with their faithful teachers, and ask that they would know that they are wonderfully made by you and that you care for them so much. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We ask our ushers to come forward as we take up the offering this morning. We're going to sing that lovely lovely worship song his name is wonderful his name is wonderful his name is wonderful his name is wonderful jesus my lord the mighty king, master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty Him. His 
His name is wonderful, Jesus my The first scripture reading this morning is from Joshua 3, verses 1 through 5, crossing the Jordan. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. The second reading is from Joshua 14, verses 4 through 7. For Joseph's descendants had become two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. The, the Levites received no shame, no share, I should say, of the land, but only towns to live in, with pasture lands for their flocks and herds. I'm sorry. Joshua 14, 4 to 7? No. Okay. Okay, sorry. Come again. <laughs> there must have been a... It's okay. Chapter 3. Number 3. Yeah, and go to verse... 7? Verse, no. Verse 14 and read all the way through to chapter 4, verse 7. Okay, we Is can that do okay? that. Sure. Thank you. Sorry, we got another. <laughs> it's going to be a little longer reading this morning, everyone. Okay. So we're still at three. So Joseph told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass it on ahead of the uh, people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan, its waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivitites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. See the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set from set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream, and will be cut off and stand in a heap. Keep going. <laughs> so when the people broke camp to the cross of the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stages all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away, and a town called Adam in the village of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. 
the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Continuing on four. Okay. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from where the priests are standing and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant with the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. And we conclude with Psalm 145, verses 1 through 7, and it's called a psalm of praise of David. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will mediate it on your wonderful, I will, sorry, I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Good morning. Well, Lillian. What can I, well done, well done. Some of those names, I was sitting there going, woo, but well done. Very much appreciate your last minute move, move there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what a beautiful morning to be here on our anniversary Sunday in fabulous weather. How wonderful is that? And so um, we have an opportunity now to pray and say thanksgiving for this church, God's church, here for 161 years. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts as we celebrate the 161st anniversary of Lakefield Baptist Church, and we honor 150 years of global ministry through our Baptist partner, Canadian Baptist Ministries. We praise you, Father, for who you are, the God and creator of the universe, the loving God who created each one of us and who knows us intimately. You are our loving Father who equips each of us to go out into the world and spread your love and your light. We thank you for your constant presence in our lives for listening to the prayers we leave with you and for walking with each of us as we journey through life. We thank you for the vision of our forefathers who planted this church here 162 years ago. We thank you and praise you for the many blessings you have poured out on this church, your church, since its existence and we pray for many more blessed years to come as we work to build up your kingdom and glorify your name. We thank you for the leadership of Lakefield Baptist, both past and present, for the pastors, the deacons, the trustees, the staff, and the many people who serve on committees and lead and teach Sunday school and Bible studies. 
We especially thank you that this church has remained faithful in teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the many things you have taught us and conveyed to us through your word and for the many answered prayers. We thank you, Father, for the many people and relationships that you have brought to us through the ministries and mission of your church over the years. And now in the silence, we remember those folks who are on heavy on our hearts this morning. We thank you for the global field staff working with Canadian Baptist Ministries that we have supported over the years. And for many folks here today and in years past who were sent out from this body of believers in your name to share the transformational power of your love to people both near and into the far corners of the earth. Dear Father, Please prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the message you have laid on the heart of Brenda Hulk, our guest speaker for this morning. May we be inspired by her message to be a voice in the wilderness of our travels, wherever they might take us. We thank you, Father, for Brenda's presence with us this morning. Please surround her with your loving peace as she shares her message with us and as she travels to her home in Waterloo later today. In your son's precious name, we pray, amen. So, did you wanna come up and join me? It is my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker and, and my friend, uh, Brenda Hulk. <laughs> Brenda, now I have to read this. Oh, yeah. there you go, welcome. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll just set that. You got that? You. You good? Yep. Okay. I am moving. I am. I am moving somewhere. Can I just? Hello. Here, let me hold. No, it. no problem. We're good. So Brenda keeps. They keep changing Brenda's roles. So I actually have it written down here. So I actually maybe get it right. Are we here, good? Wait, no, I'm good. Try this. Whoa. We are a team. We've done this before. Sort of, there we are. <laughs> okay, Brenda is the Senior Associate of Strategic Projects with CBM's International Partnerships team. She collaborates with a program called Venture, which is sort of taking faith and work and putting them together as a combination, and also women's initiatives, many women's initiatives. In fact, that's how Brenda and I met many years ago, we won't tell you how many, um, working with Baptist women. And uh, Brenda is the facilitator of the Groups of Hope, a fabulous program. She has served in many capacities within CBM, among them as a volunteer board member, a facilitator for Discover Workshops, and a leader of Scent Trips. Uh, Brenda has served in various positions over the years with Baptist Women. Uh, she is dedicated to equipping, mentoring, and training women to become effective agents of change in their homes, in their churches, and in their communities. She believes that work is a strategic mission field. And so to this end, she focuses on assisting partners in discipline, faith and work together, and new income generating initiatives, mostly for often for women who are really struggling to care for their families. A quick prayer, and then I'm going to okay. give you your space back. <laughs> Brenda. May you sense God's presence in this place as you share with us the message he has placed on your heart. Amen. Amen. And we welcome you, friend. Thank you. Take care. I will leave you to this. Water is healing. Well, it's my pleasure to be here and to be with you on this beautiful, beautiful day to celebrate two anniversaries. 
um, your anniversary of 161 years, which surpasses CBM's 150th anniversary, which means you were here in 1863, prior to the creation of Canada. You predated this country, which was created in 1867. So the Lord went ahead of us in planting his word and his uh, gospel in this place prior to the country even being formed. Um, this year, CBM is very excited to celebrate 150 years of our Canadian Baptist serving in global mission. Um, I'm going to speak briefly about CBM. Any, everything that Cheryl mentioned is probably a sermon in itself, but especially my passion for venture, which is the integration for faith and work. But we, but this morning, I want to thank you for partnering with CBM in God's invitation to embrace a broken world. In 1874, CBM's work began, and two years later, in 1876, the roots of Baptist women were planted. They were planted by Dr. A.V. Timpany, who was a missionary, a Canadian Baptist missionary to India, who came home on furlough and appealed to the women of Ontario and Quebec to send and support female missionaries to India. At that time, because of the gender issues, a male pastor could not minister to women. So they needed women to go and help the women. Um, in 1876, the women organized. That was the beginning of their mission circles. By the early 1910, they had 129 Canadian women in India alone. And the work had also expanded to Bolivia. But anniversaries are a great time to reflect, to take stock of where we've been, where we are now, and where is God calling us in the future. You are part of a long history of faithfulness and prayer that has been sharing the love of Christ for 161 years. There are lots of special resources available for you on our um, 150th site, kaba150.ca, where you'll find videos, music, litanies, worship resources, greetings from our global partners. One of the things we have done to celebrate is CBM commissioned the writing of a piece of music to celebrate 150 years. And it also is the best way in only a few minutes to show you some of the pictures from our past, some of the pictures of our first people who went out by boat, taking two to three months to arrive at their destination with letters taking the same amount of time to return. So we're going to watch that celebration video from CBM to begin our time together. stepped out in the river mercy was flowing their hearts were burning with your holy fire bringing your blessing serving reflecting hope for the lost and the
And that video is available online for you to download and use however you like, as well as the sheet music is available, the lyrics for whatever purposes you like. You will see at one of the shots where it showed a group of Indian people, it appeared to be hundreds of thousands of them. Um, that picture was taken in January. We've been celebrating with our partners across Canada and globally all through 2024, and also interviewing alumni and Audrey Morikawa, who's in her 90s now, but was a woman who went out to the Sura people in the 60s, saw that video um, and was in tears. When she went out, she said there were a handful of Christians. That particular video were the 100,000 plus Suras who came out for the CBM celebration, walking miles and miles from their villages, and only one of many um, celebrations in India that are ongoing throughout the year. So I invite you to check out our site and use those resources as, every, as, as you can. So I'm going to take a look at, I'm going to jump to slide four now. Um, 
and talk to you a bit about some of the principles under which CBM work because we work solely in partnership. We work partner with churches within Canada, with our partners such as CBOQ and Atlantic Baptist in Canada, and we only partner with local churches around the world to bring hope, healing, and reconciliation through word and deed. We are 972 churches. We work in 26 countries under five causes, and in 2023, more than 120,000 people worldwide benefited from our common calling to share the gospel through word and deed. And we'll take a look at slide number six. Um, this shows the 26 countries in which we work. However, you're saying there's only 25 up there. That's because one of them is a closed country in which we are not able to talk about or advertise or put anything on our website. But we do work within 26 countries. And we work under five causes, which is the next slide. We work and we'll go through these each one at a time, just briefly. The first one is the next slide, which is poverty. We work within areas of poverty where we believe that embracing compassion will fight suffering. Poverty is part of the majority world. We live in the minority world. Um, and it's the roots of many other issues. The second cause is justice. And justice is embracing dignity, which then challenges inequity. And justice is an underlying issue behind most of the world's inequity, behind poverty, behind educational inequity, behind gender and women's rights, behind those rights that are not just gender and women's rights, but they're human rights. They're all issues of justice, justice and access. Our third cause is, um, I'm trying not to look at the screen, and it's really hard. <laughs> Uh, building the church. Maybe it's kids at risk. Let me see where we're at. It's kids at risk. Sorry, embracing, um, embracing kids at risk in, where hope will relieve despair. Kids at risk who are in um, child-centered households where there are no parents or grandparents to look after them and the adult is a five-year-old and due to poverty, war, HIV, AIDS, multiple causes, COVID-19, causes that are growing and increasing uh, the number of children at risk. And the next one, our next cause is build the church. Embracing love banishes fear and building the church, helping to build up the church itself, the pastors, the leadership is one of CBM's key goals, which is to provide sustainability and independence. We like to say we like to work ourselves out of a job. A hundred years ago, we sent teachers for a career. And when they came home, there was no teacher. Now we choose to train the teachers and send our own people back. And we are, have an increasing number of global field staff and national field staff who are from their own country. Our team lead in Asia is now Siraj Kamaravalli from India. Our team lead for Africa is Andre Sibomana from Rwanda. And those highly skilled, well-educated people are um, doing the jobs that Canadians would have done 30, 40 years ago, accompanied by Canadians along the way. Those are our five causes. And we also work through what we call word and deed, which is not just the old model of evangelizing and preaching the gospel, or the sharing way relief model of providing food and relief, but the model of uh, doing both at the same time, of integrating both. And sometimes the uh, deed comes first. Sometimes we need to feed people who are starving. And we don't possibly maybe even preach the gospel, but they read it through the lives of the people who are serving them. Other times when we're building the church, it's giving theological training first to pastors who can then minister to their people. And if you ask me which one of those is most important, 
I would tell you which wing of a bird can you take off and still have it fly. Um, they are both required. And the last cause I want to talk about is crisis response. This is one that we cannot budget for, um, but we respond to a world in crisis. And since COVID-19, we have also responded to the Beirut explosions, the natural disasters such as earthquakes in Haiti and Turkey, flooding in South Sudan and Pakistan, intense storms in Malawi, Rwanda and Cuba. We have assisted thousands of individuals displaced by conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, South Sudan, Lebanon and Ukraine, and in refugee camps in Greece and Cyprus. We have a very nimble, pivotable organization that within 24 hours of a war or a disaster, we have pivoted for what we were doing to what we are now doing. You will see it come up on our site and they will be opening an appeal for funding for relief in those areas. And in the last few years, it just seems that it is one thing on top of another, that it crises just worldwide are just seem to be increasing. Our local partners work in communities where conflict, changes in climate, disasters and soaring costs, supply chain vulnerabilities, and the after effects of the pandemic push many into a life of uncertainty. Poverty, hunger, health, security are just some of the issues that have become more pronounced in recent times. And we continue to raise up and empower women through education, employment, literacy and leadership training, mentoring both adolescent boys and girls in Kenya, counseling for victims of sexual assault in the Congo, helping widows to start businesses, and restoration of victims of sexual exploitation and trafficka, trafficking in India are only a few examples of projects that aid vulnerable women. When you empower a woman, you improve her life, that of her family, the church, the community, and society itself. When, we, when women are empowered, communities are transformed and the next generations grow healthy and strong. Um, and I want to emphasize when people say, why is there a focus on gender? Our focus is on both genders, on human rights. Most women's issues are human rights issues and the lack of access to education is a human rights issue. Unfortunately, all of these crises that I just named impact women more negatively than they do men. For example, in the pandemic, in countries like um, the Philippines, where most women's um, employment, even in Canada, is um, as caregivers or nannies, as soon as the lockdown went in and the parents were home, they were out of a job. They were the most vulnerable in losing jobs, losing jobs in retail, losing jobs in hospitality and restaurants where they were immediately. So it's not a, that that's our specific focus, it's that that's where all of these crises impact most heavily on women and children, which is unfortunate. Um, I work in the area that Cheryl had mentioned, a venture which integrates faith and work. And really as part of integral mission, the simplest way to describe it is helping you understand that you're part of your whole life discipleship for Christ is living every day for him. And no matter what role you're in from Sunday to Saturday, you're working for Christ. Whether you're in business, whether you're a caregiver, in education, in a farmer, um, a volunteer, everything you do is done unto the Lord. So in closing of this section, don't get ready to go home and have lunch yet. Um, I want to thank you for being a part of a long history of faithfulness and prayer that has brought hope and healing to a broken world. None of this would be possible without the generations of devoted service and the legacy we all uniquely share as Canadian Baptists. So as we gather together today, celebrate together with CBM 150 years and with Lakefield, your 161 
Together, let us learn from the faithfulness of Christ in the past, commit ourselves to him as Lord of the present, and trust him to lead us confidently into the future. And we will, we will just end there. There is a, a thank you slide that I'll just skip. I want to move now to talking a little bit about anniversaries. And thank you, Lillian, for pivoting on that scripture. I really, I know it stuck you with a lot of eight words that you handled wonderfully. And it was really important to have the story because it's going to, it's a critical part of what I'm going to talk about. Let's think about your anniversary and CBM's anniversary for a few minutes. Um, anniversaries are kind of like birthdays. They're really good for you because it's been proven the more you have, the longer you live. Um, it's also a good time to reflect, to take stock of where we've been, where we are now, and most importantly, where is God calling us in the future? In the passage that Lillian read, from Joshua. This is one of the most significant events in the life of Israel. They are crossing into the promised land. Moses has died. The people have wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. It is now up to Joshua to lead the people into the land that God has given them. It's a time of challenge of the future. Joshua is 80 years old, and he's at the edge, rallying all these troops to lead the people across the River Jordan to Canaan to take Jericho and other cities, the promised land. The River Jordan is at flood stage. Normally, about 40 feet across, they estimate it was 100 to 150 feet deep at this time and one mile across. And Jordan is rallying the troops to pick up the ark and cross the river. So you can imagine the reception he was getting. But the Jordan is the dividing line. It's the place where they had to decide, are we going to trust the living God and move into an unknown and unforeseen future? As a church today, our anniversaries naturally turn us back to look at our history, but we must not let what we must let that history be the impetus to move us into the future. Jesus has commissioned us and sent us into the world. How now are we going to fill it out? Looking back, or sometimes the rearview mirror, or the good old times can be interesting remembrances. But the good old days are often seen through the perspective of rose-colored glasses. Today, you might read something like this in our newspaper. The world is too big for us. There is too much going on. Too many crimes, too much violence and excitement. Try as you will, you get behind in the race. It's an incessant strain to keep pace and still you lose ground. Science empties its discoveries on you so fast that you stagger beneath them in hopeless bewilderment. The political world is news seen so rapidly you're out of breath trying to keep pace with who's in and who's out. Everything is high pressure. Human nature cannot take much more. This was published in the Atlantic Journal on June 16, 1833. Unless you think you're the only, we are the only generation to worry about how we will run our electric vehicles in an energy crisis, check out this headline from November 13th, 1857 in the Boston Globe. Energy crisis looms, world will go dark, whale blubber is scarce. It's fun to look back on the memories. We have a family cottage that is flooded with memories of family times together. And church is filled with memories, if only these boards could speak. There are memories of the people who have gone before us on whose shoulders we stand. There was a time where women wore hats and gloves, and men always wore a suit. And in your neighborhood, a car from almost every driveway left pulled out in the morning to attend church. 
Stores were closed, streets were quiet. I remember my dad looking in the newspaper to see which single gas station was allowed to be open on Sunday so we could go for a drive. Radio stations only played Christian music and the people in those pews were faced the other way. In our church, they revolved the entire church. They decided the church should face that way. And to this day, nobody knew why we thought we would be better Christians if we turned everything around and looked that way. But we need to know where we've been because there are two lasting bequests we can give our children. One is roots and the other is wings. Like a map, we need to know where you're coming from in order to point the car in the direction ahead. The past was a time of root setting. We've been fed and watered by those who have gone before us. We have been taught by our teachers and leaders. We owe who we are to our past, to our heritage, our upbringing, our education and traditions. You and I and this congregation are products of where people have been before us. But things have changed. As Dorothy is told in The Wizard of Oz, we're not in Kansas anymore. If we did not know this before, we certainly know it since COVID-19, where we were suddenly in lockdown and the church had to look at the question, how can the church be the church when we can't gather? It really was what we've all been saying and now had to put our money where our mouth was, where we all have been saying the church is God's people, not the building. But the shock we had when the buildings were closed, how could we be a church that was scattered? So who's in the pews, how we look, how we worship has changed radically. Now without a calendar, it's impossible to tell if it's a Sunday or a Saturday in the city. Lawn mowers and stores, on my street, only one, sometimes two cars pull out to go to church. We've grown and changed. And we're not sure when that happened exactly. But the call to follow Christ is a call to change. We cannot predict these changes that are taking place. There is no strategic plan for how we're going to look tomorrow. God has, but God has been ahead of us. His will and plan, though, does not always proceed in a straight line. But we have strong roots, we have been faithful, and we have followed. And in Joshua 3, 5, he says, Concentrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. How we do worship and missions is different, but be reassured, the goal never changes. The author of it remains the same. Con consecrate yourself is to be holy, to set, be set apart for a sacred purpose. Prepare yourself. It's waiting on God. It's spiritual root setting and renewal, setting your roots deep into the soil of God's love. Consecrating yourself is, getting pre is preparing to follow God through transitions into new places it's getting ready for the ride. So Joshua's people were told, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. Joshua and the people are on the edge of a new day, and we too are on the edge of the next phase of our life and of our church's life. But the challenge is to make yourself holy, ready to receive God's instructions, and to follow. Just as we prepare flower beds for planting, foundations for building, we clean baking sheets to bake cookies and prep walls for painting, we must prepare our hearts and minds to receive the word. It's time for a reset, for a new normal, to recalculate your GPS. Moving on in your church's life begins at this starting point. It's getting ready. It's getting prepared to follow God into the next phase. So open your hearts, receive, and get ready to follow. 
Can you imagine the excitement and anticipation of the people of Israel after 40 years of waiting, they are now on the edge of claiming God's promise. They're ready to experience new wonders, to pass through Jordan and to defeat Jericho, to take and experience the goodness of the promised land. John Ortberg has written an amazing book called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. And it's encouraging you to step out of the boat. It always reminds me of the picture or the passage of Peter walking on water where he's in the storm and P Jesus comes to them and says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answers him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong winds, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him. Peter's walk was a response to an invitation to step out in faith, to step out of the boat. There's a pattern here. There's always a call, then there's always fear, then there's reassurance, a decision, and a changed life. Water walking is doing with God's help what you could never do on your own. So can you imagine the cry of break on out, move on out, break camp, uproot their lives to follow God on a promise that is 500 years old, and they finally receive what they have been praying for. God did amazing things that day. Not only was there a river between them and the promised land, but it is the rainy season. The river is at flood stage, a rushing torrent without a bridge, and people on the other side waiting to kill the Israelites when they cross. Imagine the shuffle of millions of feet, the bleating of animals, the taste of dust, mothers clutch babies, wide-eyed children squeeze their father's hands, old men hobble on their staffs, and young wives clutch their husbands' arms, and the priests step forward and shoulder the ark. The river is overflowing. It's an impossible barrier. They have not passed this way before. They're a desert period people with no experience of raging water. But God has promised to stop the flow of water once they step into it. This is what's called the first step principle. The waters did not part until they put their feet into it. God doesn't eliminate obstacles but he will take people through them. And when the people were obedient to God, God was faithful. And God's call to us today is to be obedient, even when we don't understand. Joshua, when they get to the middle, the 12 um, leaders of the tribe stop, and he instructs them to take 12 stones and place them in the river. It's a remembrance, he says, for the next generation. When your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them, these stones will be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. And the circle is complete. As we stand here today, we are seeding and planting and nurturing the roots of the next generation preparing our own lives to follow God into the future. And you have come 360 degrees. The challenge is to pass it on. Jesus told his disciples to remember what he had done, but he also turned their attention to the future. Go and be my witnesses. Go and work in the vineyard 
go and make disciples, and Jesus has commissioned us. So go into the marketplace, the schools, the prisons, the retirement homes, the hospital. Go into the world and don't leave it as you found it. God's call is as clear today as ever. We must be ready to step out of our comfort zone and be ready to meet the challenges of a world whose sands are constantly shifting. So as you celebrate your anniversary today, listen to this verse. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, that we journey with an ever-present, ever-loving, and constant God. Lord, you walk behind us so we are protected, beside us so we have companionship, and ahead of us to lead us. Lord, we ask that you would deepen our roots, strengthen our ability to follow. Give us the courage to step out of our comfort zone and into our future. Amen. Oh my goodness. This is don't leave her. <laughs> Sorry, we had a lamb. There's a lamb falling out of the pulpit. <laughs> Sorry, my dear. On behalf of the congregation, I just like to I think you can hear me. Uh, I'd just like to thank you for coming and bringing this message. Uh, thank you for reminding us of our roots and knowing that we also need wings if we're going to move forward and to have that faith in God that um, he will see us through when we consecrate, take that first step, and um, follow him. Thank you very much for that. Um, a, a card here, um, and I, I've got a little porch plant for you for a wee. Oh, a little porch plant for you. Lovely, thank you. There you go. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, as we consider um, the challenges and the words that Brenda has brought to us today, our final hymn says, all the way my Saviour leads me. It is because his presence is beside us that we can step out and we can place our trust in him. So let's stand and sing together. Gushing from the rock before me, 
lo, a spring of joy I sing. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the wonderful church and uh, Brenda that was just a beautiful message this morning I think uh, just it doesn't surprise me how the Holy Spirit works because Thursday is our visioning meeting with our leadership team and so I think you just completed my powerpoints today <laughs> so bless you and thank you church the benediction and now I commend you to God and to his gracious word which has power to build you up and give you your heritage among all who are dedicated to him. God bless you, friends. Wonderful day. And thank you again, Brenda. Bless you.